Hi, welcome to the talk on mice and elephants. My name is uh, Kun Seng and I'm from DBS. DBS is a bank that's headquartered in Singapore and we actually have a regional presence in many countries in Asia. So I'll begin by introducing myself uh, before going on to introduce my co-presenter. I received a master's in electrical engineering from Columbia University in 1996, which is quite a while back, and a bachelor's in computer science from NUS uh, in 91. By day, I actually lead the SRE group in DBS under middle office, and by night, I enjoy writing Python scripts and coding along with my teams. Now I hand it over to my co-presenter, uh, Sandeep. Hello, everyone. Being in the IT industry for the past 16 years, I've seen many changes during this period. Transitioned into various roles, with SRE being my favorite transition thus far. I lead the SRE tools team in DBS Bank and have the responsibility to ensure that our SRE enablers and internal tools function at all times. I'm also responsible to conduct blameless retrospectives in the bank, which gives me a joy of learning and sharing knowledge across the enterprise. On top of this, I'm a sci-fi lover with a special interest in stars and galaxies and a dream to explore the space one day. So let me start by telling you a story. So it's a story of our data lake, uh, which actually started around 2017. Uh, at that point in time, right, Hadoop was a new technology to us, and so the bank was really interested to exploit this technology that you know, had great potential to bring in and crunch massive amounts of data. So during that period, right, we started with a cluster which is kind of semi-physical and then semi-virtual. It grew basically in three times, right, uh, in, in terms of the number of cores, from about 720 to around 2,500 cores. The memory also grew you know, to around 22 terabytes, and also in terms of storage, right, we grew to around close to 900 terabytes in total, right? So during that period, right, the cluster was like a mismatch of different types of technology. There were physical nodes, there were virtualized nodes, and the storage itself was also on physical disk, as well as some of it was also on object store, mounted as a virtual file system. So in terms of the period of growth, really the emphasis was more on getting applications onboarded and getting the business cases going as fast as we could. Uh, that was really the mindset at the point. So all this while, while the cluster was growing and the users were getting on border, right, a silence menace was actually lurking in the background. One thing that we didn't notice was that 88% of all files in our file system were actually less than 5 megabytes. And worse, it was scattered all over the place on virtualized, some of the virtual file systems, as well as on the local disk. So if you look at the histogram below, right, it kind of gives you the distribution of the file sizes. And on the y-axis, it's actually in million. So you can see the biggest chunk, a full 16 million files, were actually less than 100 kilobytes, very small. Right? And even the pink ones, was, well, they were the bigger ones, right? greater than 5 megabytes. Everything else you see, other than pink ones, were actually considered very small files on, on the head of file system. Now, while this was happening, right, nobody was really paying that much attention because it was something that was part of the onboarding. You know, you got your data in, and you got your files in, and basically you put them where they were, where they're meant to be. Uh, however, this is going to cause a problem, and you know uh, we'll see later on. Then one fateful, dark and stormy night. It was actually a day, actually. It was a night. It was on May the 31st, 2019. Right? So what happened that day was that there was a software bug in one of the test jobs. And this software bug caused the test job to write arbitrary long paths into the file system. So imagine a job writing paths a thousand uh, nested directories deep. Right? 1,001, 1,002, it just kept writing and writing. Right? This actually eventually caused the system to have a failure. Why? Because you can't really have infinitely long nested directories. The virtual file system would say fail. You know, I can't have such a long URL. I couldn't actually write to it. Right? And, you know, but because the system, the, the job was at fault, right? it didn't know, it just kept writing. Right? So this actually eventually led to a failure of like 2,900 failures per minute, constant failures. Right? And coincidentally, during that period, right, there was a bug in the uh, a firmware bug actually in the object store, right? Which actually, when it saw this high amount of recurring errors, it started to reboot the appliance itself. So you have this on one hand uh, appliances, uh, which is actually storing all the data files right, for the virtualized file system rebooting, and all the other data nodes looking at it and say, oh, my file system got rebooted, so I better recheck the whole file system. So this is actually where everything went into chaos. The nodes started looking at the file systems and said, oh, I need to do a file system check. Everybody started to do a file system check. On the other hand, the file system itself was continuously rebooting. right? So when the system administrators saw this was happening, right, they put a stop. They said, okay, fine, let's stop the reboots, let's manually start it up, and then let's try and bring up the whole cluster. And when that happened, right, the nodes naturally right, tried to rebuild the file system because you know, it said 
my file system rebooted, let me scan every file, make sure every file is there, right? And this is where the problem actually manifested. We found out that, you know, the, because of the number of small files scattered throughout the file system, the scanning process took very long. In fact, the, it slowed down the aggregate throughput of the ob object file system to like 30 to 90 megabytes per second, which is really very slow for a, you know, enterprise scale uh, object store, right? So the whole recovery process got stuck because, you know, the, the recovery was too slow. You know, you're, you're going to actually basically try to read out these files one by one, and it was taking far too long. So what happened after that, right? So once they realized that really there was a problem in bringing out the file system and letting all the nodes scan, the only way was to actually copy out these individual files one by one out from the object store, you know, into, a, uh, into the local storage of the disk and then boot up the disk as per normal, right? So that you don't have this object store there, right? And this is also the place where the small files became more evident than ever before, right? Because there were millions of them, you had to copy them one by one, right? But on the other hand, you know, you have the other side, the pressure, right, of running the system coming up, right? You know, you're one day behind, the cluster is one day down. And then you've got files coming in, new batch to process, right? So you have this, this kind of a interplay of, you know, prioritization, which batch should I do, which partition should I restore first, right? So that the batch can continue on as fast as possible, uh, as quick as possible, right? So in the end, it was, you know, a very painstaking 24-hour round-the-clock operation of picking the files out of the highest priority uh, applications and restoring them on the local system and then slowly bringing up the cluster node by node, uh, application by application, right? And this took basically almost about five days to, to six days, right? Uh, fortunately, it, you know, eventually, uh, after a period of several days, right, you know, everything was recovered and the cluster, you know, we didn't have any lost files at all, which was actually very good. So I think throughout this whole process, right, I mean, I, there were several lessons to be learned, right? One of which, of course, is the technical issue of small files. But the other thing was that uh, when this happened, right, there was this uh, sense of blamelessness, you know, so in the SRE culture, you know, we talk very much about uh, being blameless, right, so we actually saw this thing uh, for, uh, you know, right, right in front, you know, having this major infrastructure go down, right, and yet everybody more or less cooperating and trying really to get to the root cause, how, how can I help, right, rather than to basically say, you know, who did, who did the problem, right, you know, was it the, the guy who wrote the, the, the job that created the small files, or was it a cluster design problem, or it was, it was some infrastructure issue, right, so I think that part played out very well, and it kind of helped us actually subsequently uh, go on and uh, build a much better cluster and basically get better lessons learned from it, uh, to the focus on trying to do and to maximize the learnings uh, from a failure like this, right? Rather than to focus on, you know, uh, the other aspects which are not so positive. So now that we've seen the story, right? I mean, let's go deeper and really understand this issue of small files and Hadoop. So what are small files and really where do they actually come from? Where is this origin of small files? So if you look at Hadoop as a technology, right? it's meant to do big data processing. And basically what you do is you bring files from different systems, many different types of files, right? And you crunch them, right? So the small files actually result from many factors, one of which is related to, for example, how frequent you bring in the data. If you bring in the data quite frequently, maybe on a daily basis, then the amount of data you bring in may not be so big. And if, for example, in this case, like for our bank, right, we have different regions and different countries, and some countries have bigger amount of data because, you know, there are more products there, right? You get bigger files because there are more records there. In other countries, it gets smaller. So by the nature of basically bringing, for example, data for a particular product, you'll get files of different sizes. The other thing is also depending on what is the nature you want to rerun the files. Right? For example, if I need to reprocess the data or I need to query the data at some uh, point in time, right? I can't have very big files because if I want to find a little bit of data in a very big file, it's going to take a long time. It's better that I chop the file smaller so that I can go straight to the file that I want to find and get the data as quickly as possible. So that's also another consideration, right? The other thing that, that's an impact directly on small files is the way you partition your data, right? And this I mean by Spark and high partitions, and I'll talk about that later. These are very standard terminologies, techniques that you use in Hadoop's file system. And then finally, right, the other thing that kind of doesn't help in the sense that in Hadoop, right, you have compression, for example, Parquet, which actually compresses the file. So you may start off with files which are not very big in the first place, right? But because of, of the compression, the files get even smaller. So that kind of creates a problem as well, right? It's a good thing to have file compression, but on the other hand, if you have files which are not very big to begin with, uh, they will get even smaller and then it becomes a problem. What does small files impact? What is really the impact, right? Now on the slide, you can see actually there are two kind of uh, uh, places where it can impact. It can impact cluster performance, meaning that it basically uh, lowers, it basically introduces an overhead to the amount of files, that you can, the amount of storage that you can store, right? Uh, because they, 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 you need a certain amount of space for housekeeping, and, and also it affects recovery as we saw in, in the case of the Hadoop incident.
I think the other place where the small file can play an impact in the application performance itself, right? If you have a lot of small files, the applications basically when you shuffle the files around, it would give you some overhead uh, versus you having big files. Okay, this is again uh, not exact trade-off and I will go maybe a little bit more detail later on. So let's look a little bit deeper into partitioning in Hadoop. So I basically put two different types of partition in this slide here, right? Hive partitions is typically what happens when you take a file in and you try to overlay, for example, a, a SQL file system, a, a relational database file system over it, right? So you partition the files basically by the columns where the data is the same. For example, you know, if I have data from many countries, I might create a partition, I might partition them by country. Each country or each country code would have a subdirectory and only data which belongs to that country would be in that. So that's basically called Hive partitions at the file system level. The other kind of partition that you have actually is uh, when you do Spark, when you do uh, processing, parallel processing, right? You basically read the data into memory and then you split the data actually across many of these nodes and you process them in parallel. So this is actually more in memory where you basically say, you know, if I, instead of having everything go into memory, which you can't fit, right? I got to break them into little chunks of them and work on each pieces in parallel and then later I might need to shuffle them because I need to aggregate the data. That is basically Spark partitions. Both of them might potentially result in small files, right? In the first case, in the high partition, right? Again, I think, uh, which as we mentioned earlier, right? If the uh, country doesn't have a lot of data, your particular partition doesn't have a lot of data, right? Then potentially you could end up with small files. One way is that, you know, I change my way of grouping, right? Instead of grouping every country into one directory, I could say all the big countries into individual directories, and then all the small countries are put into a region, like, for example, you know, Asia instead of having three countries, Taiwan, Indonesia, Malaysia, I put them under Asia, but I would have to duplicate, I would have to add another column to say, oh, this is Asia, right? But then there's another column to say, it's actually Malaysia and Asia, right? Versus all the other countries. That's the trade-off, right? The other side, in case of the Spark partition, right? You could actually do one thing is that before you write the files, you know, in memory, you could actually coalesce them to say that, you know, when I was doing my computation, I split the data into pieces and spread it across all the nodes to get the parallelism. But before I write it to this, right? Let me join them together. Let me coalesce them together into less pieces, but bigger pieces before I write to this. And this we will go into a little bit more detail later on with some of the utilities that we actually built. So we did actually a performance study on the overheads of small files. For example, if you know one HDFS block, typically, you know, you can store up to, by default, 128 megabytes. And you know for each one of these 128 megabytes of blocks, right, you actually incur about 150 bytes of heap on a node. Because in Hadoop, you keep your name nodes, the records in memory. There's basically a limit to the amount of blocks that you can actually store or the information about it. You also have this replication factor tree. In this slide, you basically try to calculate for a given uh, size, for example, a one gigabyte file, right? Uh, if I break it into sizes, uh, files of basically 128 megabytes or a one megabyte pieces or a one kilobyte piece, right? You can actually calculate the overhead and it's actually quite stunning because at the smallest granularity, if you have one byte, right? Imagine for one byte, you have to store 150 bytes, right? That's really a, a big overhead, right? For the whole file system, right? So you really get that kind of uh, exponential decline in the amount of storage you have. The other side, what you can look at is also in terms of the cluster capacity, how much can you actually store if your small files are actually one kilobyte in size, right? You can't really store that much. Why? Because you would basically run out of accounting space on the name node before long. These are the two big impacts on small files. One is the amount of heap memory you use on your name node and which directly affects the cluster capacity, how much storage you can have actually on your cluster as a whole. So right now I hand over to my other co-presenter, Sandeep, uh, who will actually take us through some of the learnings that we learned uh, regarding all these things. Sandeep, over to you. Thanks, Kun Singh. So let me take you through on how did we do the SRE retrospective for this problem in DBS way. We as SREs started to deep dive on what went wrong, looked at the end-to-end -end aspects. In the data world, there are two key pieces of workflows which are performed by different teams. First is ingestion, which is done by tools like Scoop, Spark, Kafka, MapReduce, Niffy. Then there's a transform work done by using Spark, MapReduce. So when you look at the ingestion area, what we found was the input from various sources are small, thus a lot of small files. Tuning of the jobs was not done properly. You're not managing the files before you write down to the staging area. Basically, poor practices were followed. Lack of understanding in big data tools. Of course, 
every tool provides best practices and frameworks that were not being followed. Similarly, in transformation area, poor tuning of jobs was there, creating too many partitions by default during transformation. Again, lack of understanding of big data tools and best practices were not followed. In a conventional way, any organization will have similar problems. This is not new. Every organization working on data will face similar challenges. The dev teams were trying to resolve problems of small files by deleting or archiving the small files from the source to reduce the number of files. For transformation, the dev teams will perform merging of SDFS small files after a certain number of days. They will also apply purging policies based on business needs. In some cases, they would even copy the SDFS files to S3 bucket or some other sources. This is not sustainable. And in the nutshell, we needed to look at the problem in an SRE way. Before I take you through this, first let me introduce you DBS SRE principles. To each his own, every organization has a different approach to SRE. For example, some look at eliminating toil. We have taken a very holistic approach. So for us, we have looked from the left side when the project gets incepted, right at the start, all the way till the end. Our mantra is, SRE is a norm, efficiently building and delivering highly observable systems with velocity and stability. We look at the architecture perspective, how we manage the capacity of our systems. We look at the development and build practices. We look at test practices, how we launch our products. Observability, incident response, how quickly we can recover or bounce back. The last two are actually related to culture. The culture drives a key aspect of success in anything. If you don't have the right mindset, you are bound to failure. So we look at two aspects, blameless incident retrospectives, the key tenant of SRE culture, that is how can we learn from the problems. Education, when we drive the train more and more SREs in the bank. So coming back to the problem, if you try to move the big boulder, which is basically to transform the organization, to spend millions of dollars to build a perfect data platform, it's too complicated. So we need to crush the boulder into smaller pieces with the various SRE principles. So we identified various areas of improvements. Deep engineering was required to cover the architecture, perform chaos testing. Governmation, not sure if you're aware of this term. I think we invented it and we use it quite often in our organization. Governmation just means automated governance. So we focus on sustainability and improving observability. Collaborating and engaging across lines of businesses blamelessly. Focus on learning to create awareness, share best practices, and certify our folks to use the big data platform. Let me start with governmation. We wanted to find a way to sustain with proper observability on what kind of queries were going in that caused a high load on Hadoop and contribute to accumulation of small files. So after a few rounds of discussion and testing, we decided to shift left use existing code quality tool in our ecosystem called SonarCube. But the problem was that SonarCube natively doesn't provide a solution for scanning big data queries. So we decided to take it as a challenge and develop our own plugin. In this slide, you can see the architecture of the SQ plugin to classify how it classifies the good or bad queries as a part of static code analysis. The languages supported today are Java, Python, Bash, R, and YAML. The list keeps growing based on the requests from our users. The plugin has two steps, lexical analysis. In this analysis, only the query construct is checked whether the query is properly formed or not, whether the Hive driver is able to pass the query or not. Also, it tries to check bad clauses like poor where clauses, cross joins, etc. in the query. The second is semantic analysis. In this analysis, the DB, the tables, the columns are checked and further checked if the table is partitioned or not figuring out the implicit cross joins, etc. This analysis actually requires a Hive metadata connection as a part of Sonar configuration. At the end of the day, we enable the automated recommendations for our users to implement. So in the below screenshots, you can see our query analyzer in action on how the bugs are identified, how users check recommendations on what are the bugs found, and everything is integrated into our pipeline. The right side actually shows that we have had good success and we have expanded the scope of the plugin from Hadoop to other big data platforms we have. And the users are reaping the benefits by saving toil hours to troubleshoot the bad queries in the production.
Let's look how we did the deep engineering. After this problem, we learned that we need to re-architect our big data platform that can work at scale, which doesn't need to be repaired or re-engineered every time we hit a problem. So if you look here, is what traditionally, what most of the organizations in the world would have done. Back in 2017, when we started our journey on Hadoop, we were also using Hadoop on the physical hardware. This provided dedicated compute resources, but we were not able to scale and had frequent performance issues. We went ahead and looked at leveraging on software-defined storage for Hadoop to scale as we needed. We segregated storage and compute. This allowed us to scale either of them independently. And by leveraging on more cloud-native architecture like microservices and Kubernetes, which allowed the users to easily consume the framework and infrastructure at much larger scale. We also provided tiered storage based on object storage for archival purposes. We had one key objective, that is to engineer a resilient and dependable data platform. From SRE perspective, when we worked on this, the whole design, when we achieved phenomenal improvements. First, 96% of cost optimization in provisioning of for persistent workload. Building an on-demand compute in minutes without the need of buying physical hardware in upfront. Productivity gains with 60% batch runtime improvements. Provided more agility with 10 times more read, two times more write improvements. 100% risk reduction with this design. Now, similar outages cannot take place. And most important thing, we were able to deliver joyful experience to our Hadoop users. Sounds good, but how, do, how does this work? How do we know it works? So here comes chaos at scale. We have an in-house chaos engineering tool called Raccoon. As the name suggests, we literally rack our apps to make them more resilient. So what did we do? What we did is that we injected various destructive and possible real-world scenarios, attack vectors, to test our new design. The attack categories, details, and their results are shown in the slide here. The attack included, you know, from st compute starvation to termination of processes, loss of LDAP, DNS, etc. Even the rogue network conditions were injected like packet loss, killing of the containers. On top of that, we did introduce scenarios like cert expiry, ID expiry, and of course, DB config corruption. By the way, we use MariaDB. All in all, 281 tests were conducted to make sure that our deep engineer efforts are success. And we did pass all of them. So now I would like to pass it back to Kun Singh to talk about the Spark partitions. Over to you, Kun Singh. Thanks, Andeep. All right, let's talk about optimal Spark partitioning. So as I talked earlier about, right, one of the problems that we have with partitioning, especially Spark partitioning in Hadoop, is that in order to split your data into little pieces and spread it across all the nodes, right, some of these pieces may become too small when you write it back to this, especially with compression. So what one of the application teams did was they wrote a utility, right, which basically, before you write, the whole partition to this, right? You kind of sample a small set of the data. So you sample randomly, maybe 10%, write that 10% of the whole um, Spark data frame into this, see what is the size of the, the file that was generated, right? Then from there on, you kind of extrapolate and you say, oh, I know if I write everything in, what's going to be the full size? Given the fact that you now know the full size of your data set that's persisted on this, right? You kind of estimate, you know, if I want to have 128 megabyte files, you know, how many partitions do I need, right? So basically, based on that, right, you could basically repartition the data before saving to this. So there is an overhead involved in sampling, in repartitioning, and, and basically calculating and estimating the correct size, right? When you implement such a thing, right, the trade-off is that you actually get very good partition sizes. You don't get very small files uh, where uh, if your data set is actually uh, relatively uh, sizable, you won't get a case where you get thousands of small little files. So that's kind of what uh, one of the application teams did uh, as a utility, that we bundled it and packaged it with the Hadoop distribution uh, for the rest of the teams. And that basically uh, allowed them to do this correct partitioning uh, while running their jobs instead of doing a cleanup after that. All right, over to you, Sandeep. Thanks, Kun Singh. Okay, collaboration, my favorite topic. So how do we collaborate blamelessly, or I should say transparently? Ethos is basically building a common understanding. We wanted to have an ethos with all engineers across the various lines of businesses. We have near real-time monitoring dashboards for small files, so applications can take appropriate actions if certain baselines are breached. We call it error budgets for small files.
On top of that, we also have high I.O. jobs and queries alerting to, for the users real time. So this graph shows the trending of the queries. And uh, also, we meet our teams monthly to share how we are burning down the files, how are we able to sustain the number month on month. This forum, we also share the best practices followed by various lines of businesses to reduce the number of high I.O. or the small files. So this is like a, more like a sharing session. All right, learning and development. So this is the last dimension that I will talk about before I pass it back again to Kun Singh. As I mentioned earlier, we wanted to create awareness for big data tools and ensure that our users and dev teams know the best practices and get certified to use the big data platforms. We covered three major topics, train in both classroom-based seminars and, of course, prior to COVID, and now remote training since then. We have created digital learning curriculum for all the topics, including Hive practices, Spark practices. Till date, we have trained and certified around 700 users, which is an achievement of its own by looking at the happy faces on the screen. The new users have to go through this training and certification before they can start to use the Big Data platform. All right, back to you, Kun Singh. Oh, the new version of the Cloudera Hadoop there's actually a promise of a new file system that will basically solve some of these small problems that we've seen with the uh, HDFS. And that system is called the Ozone File System. Now, fundamentally, what the Ozone File System does is it basically separates this idea of housekeeping, right? Basically, the namespace management of the files and blocks from the block storage itself, right? By separating this thing, right, you basically don't have this issue of basically uh, the namespace having to have you know, records of every single block, which becomes a big limitation when you have small files and you know, these small files take up space on your namespace. Right? So the Ozone is a, is a relatively new file system. Uh, at DBS, we're experimenting it uh, with it. We are uh, doing testing with it, benchmarking with it. Uh, I think it's relatively pr promising at this point in time. You get a relatively fast performance uh, without the small files problem. And, and this is what we're actually pursuing. So with Ozone, what we do is that we kind of implement a layer between the hot file system, which is HDFS, the fastest file system, where you actually do most of your daily compute, and the cold storage, where you know typically you put it in object store, like Sandeep mentioned, S3, right? We kind of put this layer in between so that you know files which are uh, beyond the retention period, less frequently used files, will automatically migrate over to the Ozone file system, where you don't have these small file problems. And then later on, you know, when they are even less frequently used, or they're for archival purposes, for uh, compliance or other audit purposes, they move them into the uh, cold storage, which is S3. So with having this way, right, having the files automatically migrate, having this tiered file system, right, basically solves some of the problems of having to do manual management and also uh, alleviates the small file problem by moving uh, the small files out of HDFS when you don't need it, as soon as you, as, actually as soon as you don't need it. So in summary, what have we learned actually from this whole incident and going through the whole process? There are five key lessons to learn, right? So the first is that, you know, you don't view it Small files has one single big problem. Really, it's not one boulder. There are really a lot of small contributing factors, and we should think about it this way. And actually, that's what we've done. Broken the boulder, and now I Sandeep put it so nicely into little pebbles, and then solve them one by one. Two, there are fundamental engineering issues uh, which we can use to solve these problems, right? You know, for example, ozone is one of them. You know, the other methods using optimal partitioning, you know, use scanning for, for files. I think this is a good a solution, a good problem to solve with some of this deep engineering. And thirdly, uh, we also, where we cannot solve the problem, right? we actually use technology to try to de-risk the problem. For example, having government inside, you know, tracking the files, uh, going to application teams, implementing error budgets to make sure that basically the problem doesn't become bigger than it actually is. Trainings for the users, and we certify them to use the big data platform. And of course, future tackling can be done by experimenting new technologies like Ozone. These are the key takeaways from this problem, and I hope you all learn from it. Thank you.